Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Dave Everett of This Old Sword Blade Reviews. Dave is one of my earliest Knife World friends, and he's a man I admire for a number of reasons like his martial arts skill with a blade, his impeccable taste in knives, his photography skills, his generosity, and his depth of knowledge. I readily admit that though not quite jealous of his collection, I am in awe of it and would like to make so much of his mine. He's gotten rid of more classic blades over the years than I've ever acquired, and we'll talk all about collecting knives and so much more right here. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share the show with a friend, especially one that you think might like this sort of interesting and obscure material. Also, if you want to download the show, you can do that to your favorite podcast app. And as always, check us out on Patreon to uh, help support the show and also see what you get in return, like uh, interview extras, uh, like you might hear from uh, the interview tonight. So uh, be sure to join us there on the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. <laughs> Dave, welcome back to the show, sir. It's great to see you. Great to be here, Bob. This uh, three is a charm, right? Three is a charm, and and we're not going to stop there. That's for sure. This I'm is happy to hear that. I'm uh, very pleased. Uh, watch your shows all the time. Your Sunday podcasts. I'm not a knife maker, but uh, I'm glad you keep bringing me back. And I'm not a a blade designer. You keep bringing me back, and those seem to be the uh, the prevalence of of your uh, your podcasts these days. But you are indeed a, a a knife collector, that's for sure. And I bet that's yep. part of the reason why you like to hear these these people who make this these things that you like talk about them. I, I want to say congratulations. Your your uh, channel is blowing up. You are um, you are very prolific. Uh, you put out a video, I think, a day, if I'm not mistaken. And if not, it, it feels like you've got a regular flow of of content and. And it ranges from the, I don't want to say pedestrian, but the everyday, say, like a Civivi folder or something, to some sort of exquisite um, custom. So uh, congratulations on all of that. Uh, how do you keep your channel going with so much new content? Um, I just relax and, and try to enjoy it, Bob. And um, I guess, you know, I get a fire lit under me every now and then as I go out and uh, see new knives coming out. It seems like we've got more new knives coming out now than ever, than yeah. even like a year ago or, or, or less. Um, you know, it, it, I, I hate to say it's like they're being stamped out, but, you know, maybe some of them are being stamped out, uh, but in a good way because, uh, you know, companies like Civivi and uh, Concept and Kaiser, uh, their send cut and so forth. They're just uh, popping them out. Uh, I see them up on, um, for, for instance, White Mountain does videos now as new knives drop and, and they're showing close ups with the knife being manipulated. And mm -hmm. uh, that kind of gets me going. Oh, that, that looks like a good one. You know, you know how it is. You, when yeah. you see something you like, you instantly identify with it. So, Although I've tried to say, well, I'm only going to collect such and such. I'm only going to collect high end. Uh, I'm only going to collect budget because I can buy more of them, you know. Um, yeah. And I'm not flipping them fast enough. You know, I've, I've gone out to NAF sale and sold a few. Uh, I think you mentioned uh, you were interested in going out to the new Love Them Knives site. Yeah. And uh, trying your hand at uh, selling a few. I may do the same. Uh, there as well, but I appear to be to myself spending much more time and energy in collecting them than in selling them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I am making that effort, you know, because pretty soon, uh, pretty soon we're going uh, to need to, to bring in more storage here. And I know storage was one of the things you wanted to talk about tonight. So 
I did, uh, I set aside a few things. You can see the clutter, you can't see the clutter on this little uh, plastic picnic table that I've set up here or on my desk next to me, but uh, I've got lots of stuff laid out so that I can just bring it right into the conversation, Bob. So Beautiful. I say, you know, uh, show me out the front. Boom, I got it out the front. <laughs> All right. Well, I definitely want, you know, as much eye candy as possible. Uh, but But you mentioned, like, you feel like even in less than a year, you've felt an acceleration in an already expanding market. What do you think that's due to? Uh, social media plays a big, big role in this. Uh, Instagram stuff comes up quickly on Instagram, I would say even more so than reviews on uh, YouTube. I've been popping stuff up on Instagram almost daily, you know, some sort of content. And I'm getting a little more savvy with it, how to link back to the YouTube review and so forth. And put up some stills. I put up some short videos I've been putting up more shorts on the YouTube channel now, and uh, it's it's amazing how that blows up. I mean, you get a lot more hits yeah. instantly with shorts uh, than you do with full reviews. And then I question, well, how long a video do I want to do on a knife? And sometimes it just escalates, and before you know it, I'm at 20 minutes, and I don't want to do 20-minute videos on, on one knife, you know? Yeah. I want to try to do maybe 12 minutes, I think, 10 to 12 minutes is the sweet spot where you can cover most of the aspects of it. And then at the same time, you know, you're not uh, having people fast forward through it. People are going to fast forward through your videos anyway. Right. I think skip, 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 skip. Um, used to have people come on the channel before I made an effort to be a little more animated and said, you're putting me to sleep. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know, <laughs> it's like, Come on, guy. You know, it's like, what do you, you know, too much study drug there, I think. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I got a two word answer for you, buddy. Breathe in, Zen breathing. Come on. Enjoy. The, get into it. That kind yeah. of thing. And, and, you know, I, I like to take my time. It's like, you know, box will arrive with a few new knives and it'll sit there for a few hours, you know, and uh, take my time. And I don't I used to, you know, it used to be the kid in the candy store, you know, tear, tear the box open kind of a thing. Yeah. And I know there's guys that do that. And it's whatever you enjoy, you know, it's, it's who you are. Um, you know, I, I've been pondering the same thing as you lately is why do we collect anything? Yeah. Why do you collect Hummels? You know, why do you, why do you collect tchotchkes that you put on your, uh, your, your mantle? Uh, this, that, and the other thing. So, I visited chat GPT, which is where we have to get all our answers these days, right? <laughs> or, or, or write all of our term papers. Um, and number one was an innate desire for acquisition. Huh. And two is the sense of ownership. Three was interest and passion. And then it goes down through connection with history and culture, aesthetics and beauty, investment. I think we're seeking perfection because I find myself doing that. I'll look at the knife. It may not be what I thought it was going to be when it's in my hand. Sometimes an ugly knife will feel terrific. And, and I'm not going to call this an ugly knife. Okay. But here's a good example. This is the Kaiser Brat. I loved it mainly because of the fact that it is an integral G10. Yeah. And I love the look of the back. And some people hate the look of the back. Some people hate the look of the blade because it's just so pedestrian, you know? Yeah. But it is one of the most fidgety knives. It's a great button lock. Uh, I mean, you could just play with this thing all day long. And locks up tight as a drum, whatever they did up front here to insert the, uh, the steel hardware underneath, inside. And there's a special way to take that apart. Uh, it, it's pretty, as far as engineering goes, it's pretty incredible. But this is an example of a knife that is fidgety. It feels great in the hand. And just 
doesn't have a wow factor to it, but it's just really solid and simple, you know? I mean, that, Dave, that's the kind of knife that um, you can only discover if you are collecting um, and or in a collecting phase. And what I mean by that is uh, that's the kind of knife that, you know, to me, it doesn't get my heart beating faster. I, I like I like the aspects. I actually do like the blade. I love the fact that it's integral G10. Uh, but I personally would only get to appreciate how awesome that knife is if I, if I was in a very acquisitive stage and I was getting all the big cold steels I wanted also and getting yeah. some of the other. Uh, uh, so I think that that is actually one of the real positives about collecting is that you can discover you can become a maven you can discover things for other people as well um it's it's the balancing the uh, acquiring and letting go that that is a hard part and there's uh, another sure. one that that you made me buy oh and that's yeah. this one yeah so how close to perfection did that get you um I We're talking of, about the Kaiser like Ma a, Mad Tonto. I usually yeah. like a, a straight knife, but you know this has a bow to it, right? Mm -hmm. So we automatically know when you hold it in the hand that the point is going to be a bit down. It's going to drop. But on uh, this one, I think it has kind of that pistol grip sort of uh, thing going for it to where that curve actually helps you align the, the point uh, straight. And I like the fact that this was um, a damn designs design. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, that's a first that I didn't know. Is it Adrian D'Souza? Yes. So he actually designed a knife for Kaiser and called it uh, the the mad. Tonto. Yeah. Yeah. Damn backwards. <laughs> if you so, can't be damned, you're mad, right? Exactly. So you, you say that you're um, you were thinking about the concept as uh, about why we collect. Um uh, I think I, uh, I, I partially agree with you or I, I hadn't quite thought of it the way you put it and I'm, I'm assimilating, but this idea of seeking perfection and, uh, of course, uh, it's kind of an abstract way to seek perfection out of a tool that gets very little yeah. use, but right. has some sort of real appeal. And, and lately I've been, um, I've been watching watch channels, uh, one in particular and, um, listening, a listening to that guy about watch collecting and kind of looking at knife collecting through that filter. And at some yeah. point, you know, in one of his videos, he was stating, look, these are, these are, these are very accurate toys, you know, uh, talking yeah. about, talking about time pieces. So is this perfection? I, fortunately, I'm not getting into watches, but <laughs> yeah. I found out that my daughter is. Oh, and uh, she's an executive in an insurance company and travels a lot. And you got to have the right bling. Oh, yeah. So, you know, she's got the, the Cartier uh, bracelets. And she just picked up, I think it was an Accutron or a Bulova or one of those from way back when, when they started making the accurate watches. No battery. It's still, it's a wind up. Oh, cool. And she found out going through the metal detector at the airport that it kills the watch. Oh, so there's something with that tuning fork that's inside of it. Yeah. So she now has to put it in her carry on stuff and let it get x-rayed. It's fine with x-rays. Wow. But you can't go through the metal detector with it. So uh, talk about perfection. I mean, I mean, you can you can make a watch that can uh, that can keep a detailed calendar, including including uh, leap days and all that until 2100, yeah. just with some plates and some springs and some gears. That's amazing to me. That is a, a sort of perfection. What in knives to you, what makes a good knife? What, how do you know if you're getting something that's good? I know, so well, many, so I, much I, variety. I'd have, to, I'd have to break that down into folder versus uh, fixed blade, right? Cause I've been picking up quite a few fixed blades lately. Yeah. Um, a lot of custom fixed blades or mid tech fixed blades. Um, to, to further my statement about perfection, don't you buy your next knife because the last one you got didn't quite have this and didn't quite have that. And you wanted one that has that aspect to it. I mean, I find myself doing that. It's like, this is good, but that's better. 
Yeah. And guess what? After you get that one, oh, there's there's another one that's better than that. So that's why I say seeking perfection right. in a strange uh, sort of a way. Uh, I don't see that on the list here that got printed out from uh, chat GPT, but um, I, I guess I'm influenced by the influencers, Bob. I hate to say it, uh, including yourself. And uh, you may show something that piques my interest. You may talk about it. And, you know, we're all influencers, whether we've got a big channel or a little channel. Uh, and how somebody talks about something is like I, I watched uh, Tomas Alas, yeah. the Tactical Tavern. He's, he's a great guy. Yeah. And uh, he brought out like a $1,200 uh, Wicked uh, Edge sharpener that I watched today. And it's like, I know I, Bob, I know I don't need another sharpener. <laughs> I just got the professional precision adjust work sharp. Ooh, and it's yeah. beautiful. It's beautiful. So I don't need a $1,200 sharpener, but after he's done, I mean, th he could do those commercials with, uh, you know, set it and forget it back in the, the eighties, yeah. the Iran Popeil, right? Uh, he he could be him. <laughs> oh yeah, he'd make a great pitch man. He's a pitch man. Yeah, yeah he's a great pitch man. Plus, he twirls things really well. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my arthritis doesn't allow that. In fact, uh, getting that thumb worked on in uh, in November. So Oof. see if I can get my grip back again. But um, I I think it's maybe it's unique features, but the knife also has to be sensible. It can't just be stupid crazy. You know, it, it just can't be so outlandish that it almost serves no purpose. For me, there has to be some practicality in it, even if it's an expensive knife out of expensive materials. Uh, it, it's got to have that solidity, that tactical uh, kind of a feel to it, right? Yeah, that's a taste thing for you. No matter whether it's got a shiny blade or a stonewash blade. You know? Right, right. So uh, we, when we're talking like tactical or gentleman or something like that, that's kind of a taste thing. So so that that's getting into what your uh, what your preferences are. And and that's uh, definitely some a place where you and I uh, resonate. I, I love your taste. I love the stuff that that you're into um, in terms of uh, objective. Is there any way? to measure uh be, okay let, let me put, put it to you this way you you have a very earnest approach to collecting uh that is i have this knife it's great but i want more out of this tool so i'm going to get that one for me it's like i like this one and i like this one and i like this one and uh, until the yeah. end of time you know i've tried to tried to figure out yeah uh, w is there an end <laughs> <laughs> well you know you we, we, we're really good at rationalizing things. You know, it, the, the mind is a great rationalizing tool. It's if you, if your desire want, if, if you desire something, you'll figure out a way why you need it. Right. Um, one of my most recent acquisitions was, is mm. the, uh, Microtech, uh, MSI. At first, uh, just as with you, I said, don't I want more point? because it's kind of a sheep's foot, right? Right. But what overrides everything else with this knife, and by the way, this is the injection molded polycarbonate version. First day I was using this and carrying it, I dropped it on the, uh, the driveway. I went to, uh, I, I, I was working outside. I was, uh, uh, putting some uh, deck tiles on my deck and so forth and opening boxes and I don't know, trimming something, opening a package. In fact, no, I was opening a package of knives that had just come in. <laughs> I, had them, I had them up on uh, my garbage can, one of those big plastic recycling yeah. cans. And I went like that, except when I went like that and gave it a little wrist flick because these aren't real. Uh, these don't. These have a soft detent, okay. just like any a bar lock, right? So there's no snappy break right there. But there's no uh, there's no chatter or anything either. It's beautiful. 
but I must have gotten halfway open and the wrist was flicking the rest of it. And I had it too tentatively in the hand and it just kept going. Oh. Well, testament to the knife, there were no marks on it, no scratches on the blade. There was a tiny little nick that you may be able to see right about there that's so insignificant that I'm just going to wait till the first time I have to sharpen it to, to just grind that off, you know? Yeah. But a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, the uh, the M390MK, they only uh, hardened it to 59 Rockwell. Uh, that might have been the reason why I didn't get a bigger chunk out of the blade. Right. You know, so yeah. maybe they've got something there after all. Maybe Tony Marfione's not a dummy. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to say that. Was, did he call Tony Marfione? Yeah, right, right. Clear. <laughs> Clearly but, he's uh, not. <laughs> it's a beautiful knife because it's about four inches. I can get a full hand on it. It's very industrial. Yeah. I like knives that have that industrial look to them. I mean... Even though this is injection molded, this stuff doesn't flex. This is this is like solid G10 sort of material. I got it with the partial serrations on purpose because I used to get all my bench mates that way. Mm -hmm. And I found a use for that for strapping and for rope and for things that are resistant to even a very sharp edge. As um, far as the point goes, I'm dropping things already. If... It's going to go right yeah. up. Yep. I mean, all you got to do if you want to use the point is bring it up so you've got the point there. And for slashing, you know, no problem. So I'm convinced that the knife is going to be my regular EDC for a while. We'll so, well, how long you say your regular EDC? How long do you keep things in your pocket? I, like I'll keep EDCs for up to a month, maybe. You know, uh, the the lightweight one I was carrying was the uh, Valkyrie. Oh, my yeah. Boss yeah. This is a beautiful, fidgety little knife. What a great button lock this is. They developed something called a Trex lock, which is their button lock. I'm pressing it with my finger, Bob, as hard as I can. Yeah. Okay. It's not disengaged. If I want to disengage it, I have to press the tip of my finger in. I like that okay. because it's going to there's going to be less accidental disengagements of this knife. Um, knives like the uh, Mad Tonto. Mm -hmm. If I do the same thing. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things about the Mad Tonto I like is how proud that button yeah. uh stands. And and I know I've mentioned it before, like the Watuga by Civivi uh or Sencut. I I've mean you really too, you really yeah. gotta dig your thumb in there. And uh I, I think I like it for the fidgetiness. I just like it easier. Uh but of course that's not that's that's not really that sh Okay, so let me ask you this: What are what are some very common mistakes people make when they're starting collections? Because this this is one that I think I'm talking about right now. Uh, I'm going for the fidgety uh, nature with the with the proud standing button, uh, as opposed to the one that's maybe more mechanically and safety sound. Uh, Anyway, it seems like a noob mistake. Of course, I'm not new to yeah. this, but uh, what what do you yeah, think the mistakes I, are that people I, make? I don't. I think if you're talking mistakes, you first have to say why would a new what's the interest of the new collector? You know. Yeah. I would say generally, new collectors get the bug from old collectors, people they watch on on YouTube, people, possibly a friend. You know. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm an old guy with very few friends, Bob. That's why you, you're probably one of my only friends. So, uh, well, well, I, I'm a, I'm I don't a... get to hobnob with with other collectors uh, yeah. face to face. It's all through uh, you know social media. So, 
All right. Well, I think that they're either a person already using a knife, maybe in a trade or outdoors, or they grew up with knives and now they're going to get more detailed and, and uh, into it. Uh, or they just like the, they're a person that likes the knife aesthetics. And there's, there's a lot to be said about uh, knife uh, aesthetics. For instance, what would make an idiot go out and buy this knife? <laughs> the sandstorm. <laughs> I mean, this is crazy. Yeah, it is beautiful. You know, it, it weighs 10 ounces. You're, you're really not going to want to be carrying it around all day. Most of us won't. Uh, it's got a big honking uh, thumb studs on it. Uh, it's integral. But I, here's something you're asking me. I love the rock pattern. Mm -hmm. That's what got me into uh, Ken Vahikate's uh, work. Right. He did the rock pattern all over the blades. He did rock does rock pattern all over the handles. Oh, yeah. By the way, there's the blade. So cool. Wow. They really, Max Ace did a real number on this redesign. Uh, that blade is well, really that's nice like the looking. Third, that's like the third or fourth gen. Um, here is the Sandstorm K, which was a uh, knockoff of the original Sandstorm. And you have this one. Yeah. Uh, so there's the rock pattern again, but uh... yeah. So you know what you you raise an interesting point. You first of all, you're showing you're showing multiple versions of the same knife. That's something we like to do. Uh, yeah, we we like we like to get updates of knives, um, but something you said. I'm an old guy with a big collection. Well, some something I've noticed uh, as I as I get older is you just tend to accumulate stuff, and if you're lucky, a little bit of money. You know, as you get older, you can you can spend more money on things yeah. uh, once certain expenses. Unless uh, you have children, Bob. Yeah, I know. I was I was gonna say it. <laughs> until certain expenses go to college, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, my, mine are all over and done with that. So, so my my point is. Um, from your perspective, these days are behind you, but there, there, there's a time, you know, when, when you're, when you're maybe coming up or you're new in a career or new in a job, or you're just, you know, you have expensive tastes. Uh, I, I, yeah. One has expensive, I have expensive tastes and you get involved in the knife collecting hobby and you become ravenous for things, you know, a collector just, God, they get their mind on something, something so beautiful like that sandstorm. Yeah. Do you think that uh, people run the risk of doing serious damage by getting too involved in collecting? Absolutely. I, I that's, they should not up and down. Absolutely. Because uh, it, it can become a habit like gambling. I mean, it could be as bad as gambling. It could be collecting stuff. There was a person I knew, an older woman, related to me indirectly years ago. I won't say exactly the relationship, but um, she would spend her evenings in front of the TV on QVC. And she'd be buying stuff and buying stuff and buying stuff. And when you went to her house, it was all there still in the boxes. Mm. And, I mean, collecting can get into hoarding, let's face it. Yep. Right? And if you whimsically just buy something, and I know if I've experienced this, it comes to you, you look at it, and somehow you have lost appreciation. It's nice, but there's going to be something nicer or you've already got something that's nicer and you acknowledge it. And uh, I think Jim Skelton did a very good video on this once. And I don't know if it was all on that, but he said, 
eventually you need to get your knives for review from a, a bottomless well. It can't be coming out of your pocket. So you either, you know, get the Patreon thing going or you get the manufacturer sending you knives or you have people loaning you knives. I know a metal complex uh, asks for people to send knives in for review. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to need to shift gears eventually <laughs> and do something like that and uh, liquidate a large portion of what I have. So uh, I, I think we... we we have to be careful that we're not hoarding things. There has to be an appreciation of even the simplest, most basic knife. Um, I recently got this one that was mm. designed by Dirk Pinkerton. Yeah. This is the Slim Flipper, I think they call it. It's a Beyond EDC knife. Uh, it's only about a $50, $50 knife. It's a 14C. It's got an amazing drop shot action. And uh, it would make somebody a great EDC utility knife. And it's very much in keeping with his uh, sheep's foot worn cliff sort mm -hmm. of uh, uh, style. Deep carry clip, nice thick stock, uh, switchable clip to the left side. Um, I appreciate... See, now that I wouldn't worry about too much. I could put that in my pocket and beat it. And yeah. I, I wouldn't, wouldn't worry about it, wouldn't think about it. But I know that it would hold up. So this, that too. This idea of opening up a package and kind of already moving beyond it before you even pull it out of the package. Yeah, that can be a really, um, that that's like a... a I've had packages come and I open them up and it's like self-disgust. It's like you could not control yourself. And you had to get this and you know you're not going to EDC this. Like I have a whole class of knives that I have in my collection that I just don't EDC, like small knives that I like. I like small knives, but I don't like carrying them, really. Bob, uh, how come I don't see a whole bunch of Fiskars bubble wrap things on the, the wall behind you hanging up on racks? Are those, those the ones you're talking about? You, the the, the cars? yeah yeah you know what i'm <laughs> those, talking about those home depot knives <laughs> right i'll even get oh yeah oh man it's a problem <laughs> like that but but yeah when when you get for instance that that beyond edc knife um maybe that's a bad example because i love pinkerton's work and beyond edc yeah. is making great stuff but you know i might get a petrified fish or something that i like that i really yeah. like the victor i love the design beautiful knife hardly ever carry it I like having it because I like to look at it. Yeah. And then sometimes it's hard to think about selling it when I actually have it in hand. But I got damn designs knives that I love because they heavily stonewash the titanium and the blade. And I'm one of these guys, if I spend a lot on a knife, I don't want to get it, I don't want to see it scratched up. Yeah. There are a lot of guys that'll buy a pricey knife, they'll buy a five, six hundred dollar microtech, and they'll just EDC it all the time and they don't mind at all. And they got it because they have faith and trust in the uh, the build of the knife, you know, that they they bought it because it's going to last. Uh, I would buy that because it's pretty. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. I, what 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 do I need it to last against the uh, the threads on my collar, you know, or whatever I'm going to use it for. Um the I like the idea of, and this is also not me, but I love the concept and idea of that guy who's got a strider or a yeah. hinderer or some really nice kick-ass knife, and he's got one of them, and he takes it to the work site with him, and he uses that thing yeah. as it was intended. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, what's the point yeah. of spending all this money on such a, uh, a workhorse, hard-to-use knife when... It's like having a Mercedes Benz and, and driving it 20. It, if he doesn't use it as a screwdriver and uses it as a knife and keeps it sharp and oiled, yeah. God bless him. Yeah, I think it's cool. Yeah. And it and it grows uh where it grows a, a you know it, it takes on a little bit of a, a life of its own. Dave, yeah. with with your collection and the sort of pace at which uh, new things come in, uh do you do your knives have, I mean, the, the knives you've sent me, I, I said up front, uh, one of the things I admire about you is your generosity. You've sent this channel so many knives 
over the past few years for giveaways and stuff, and some I've adopted. They're all immaculate. Is this because you are fastidious, or is this because you have so many knives, none of them end up taking on too much wear? Well, yeah, and that's part of it. Um, there's probably a good, if I looked at everything, there's probably a good 15 knives that have seen a lot of pocket carry, right? And I keep going back to the same ones, but like I showed you, some of the newer ones uh, that have come in, uh, I've been uh, EDCing quite a bit like that. Well, first of all, the, the MSI, right? And that's going to see more EDC. I got it in the polymer handle. I've got one in the G10 handle with a smooth edge. And I've got the, the stitch ram lock. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, and I got the stitch auto, as you know. But uh, this was another one I was I probably carried quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I, I don't get them down in the dirt and get them all gnarly and everything. So they, they stay in pretty good shape. But I probably never sent you anything that's been really used or carried. Yeah. So. Okay. Because I figure if you if it's a giveaway, uh, the person would want a new knife. Right, right. If you uh, adopt it, you would want a new knife. If I give you one as uh, uh, acknowledging your birthday, that should be beautiful. That should oh, be dude, that name, you know, yeah, and, uh, should should have a certain uh, certain something that aligns with your character and your interests. So, oh, you nailed it. Yeah, yeah. Here's another one I'd like to show real quick, and oh, that's God, the that. uh, that's the uh, Williams uh, Otanashi, not no Otanashi no Ken. It's the uh, Otanashi. It's the Mini Kaiken. <laughs> yeah, but it's the Mini Kaiken Flipper, uh, and they did something extremely interesting with this, in that it is integral fat carbon fiber Ooh. but it isn't just fat carbon fiber it's spectral fat carbon fiber and they have tested the stress on the uh frame lock 100 000 cycles wow without it fatiguing they must have rigged the jig with a with a machine right it's got a hardened steel insert here the rest of the knife is all just spectral carbon fiber. And the spectral carbon fiber was something that the owner of the Fat Carbon Company developed uh, specifically for high-stress industrial uh, purposes. Hmm. M390 blade uh, designed by Chris Williams, I believe, which is uh, John Williams, uh, James Williams' son. John Williams. Yeah. Boston yeah, I, I I met those guys. Uh, I met I met the brothers at uh, at Palacio. And you interviewed uh, James. Yeah, what a yeah. cool dude. Great Man. great interview. Oh, uh, he's uh, yeah, he's a he's sort of a modern mystic in a, in in some ways. He kind of had a little bit of that vibe uh, yep. because he studied so many of those esoteric um, arts. Well, he's the uh, guy who could defeat you with his mind before he needs to defeat you with his knife, I think. You know? Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. And then he, yeah. if he had to defeat you with his knife, it'd be, you know, embarrassing and very final. You wouldn't see yeah. it coming, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I want to talk a little bit about how you manage your collection in terms of, um, well, I want to find out how you store your stuff, but, but also... Um, is it readily available? Um, in other words, is can you if you decide at, at one moment, oh that that knife I got uh, you know a year ago that I wasn't I want to grab that. Are they all at your fingertips? How do you how do you maintain? I would say ninety percent uh, of the time I can find them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I I have kind of a mental catalog going, but I also have a database where I log everything. So, for instance, if I give you knives, they come, they go into the deleted. They're no longer in my database, so I know I don't have them anymore. Right. Um, as I was mentioning, I think in a uh, in a DM or or in a in a chat uh, message, uh, maybe your last show. Uh, I uh, 
I store some in the, uh, quite a few in their boxes. In fact, if you look at the table in front of me here, I've got quite a few in the boxes because I feel for knives I'm not going to use a lot. Uh, it's an easy way to catalog because mm -hmm. I've got I've got a big metal uh, cabinet from Staples, right, with the uh, locking doors, uh, kind of file cabinet material, uh, sheet metal, right. And uh, all the Civivis are in one column. If I've got an overflow, then the column next to them has more Civivis. I got all the Concept, all the Kaisers, and uh, they're all in, uh, you know, similar sorts of boxes, right? The only thing about Civivi is uh, somebody decided they were going to put the labels on the side instead of the ends. Oh, yeah. Which kind of uh, throws me. Now... Something I got recently, a lot of people talk about putting them in cases, right? Oh, yeah. This That's is nice... a $55 case. Okay. It's, I happen to have most of the better Tucson knives in this case. So that's sort of a Pelican style. Um... Well, it, it isn't and it isn't. You see that it's got a flex to it? Yeah. But it's not cheap flex. It's not like it's going to collapse. And then uh, they give you pluck out slots that are not pick and pluck. Okay. This is mil spec foam. And your options are the size you want to pluck out for knives. Oh, that looks great. I like that you have them sideways like that so you can observe the that, whole. That, that is the only way they will let you put it in the case. Now, this is just the top layer. There's two layers under that. Mm. So there, it's flexible. You do have to be careful with this. I actually just stuck my finger on the point of a knife <laughs> that happens to be this uh, Tucson. Ooh. Button lock. And uh, the point's protruding enough that where I stuck my finger on it. I don't like that. Anyway. Oh, look at that. Okay, they, so it's on a large, flexible sort of platter of foam. Well, there's there's two layers of the, uh, the mil-spec foam, right? Yeah. The top layer is cut out, and the bottom layer is a support for the knife. And then under that is another row altogether uh 60 knives wow in this case and uh you can feel it because this has got to weigh about 40 pounds <laughs> so you keep all your two sons in there you keep your a lot of the stuff that you know you're not going to be uh using and carrying in their boxes in a uh in a file cabinet uh, what what is how do you keep your most mm, most in rotation stuff uh, knives readily handy? Uh, if I need a blood test, I'm all set tonight. Um, in rotation, um, that would be in an actual um, Pelican style case that holds forty. And that was actually Harbor Freight makes an excellent case called the Apache. And then I got the uh, the foam from uh, Nalpac. Mm, okay. And Nalpac makes excellent foam, but the cutouts, you drop them down and first. And you can't really see what knife is what. Um I would say the most readily available storage I have, and I'm going to try something that I may regret, but we'll see. And these guys. Oh, okay. And these were originally designed for paper. Hopefully I don't drop the laptop. Oh, yeah. Drawers full of premium knives. Love it. So... Those are the loose ones. And then up here, some are in the cases. 
but some of the ones in those uh, plastic cases like the PMP knives. Right. And then I've got some Microtech and uh, higher end stuff up here, either in the boxes or in the pouches. And then um, you have to guess what's in this one. Mm, Stitch Auto. <laughs> nope. Let's see if I can get my camera back here. As I like seeing all the Filipino swords on the wall as you turned around. That was pretty cool. Yeah, I moved <laughs> one just so I'd have a sword behind me over there. Nice. Now, this was this is one of my favoritest knives. You'll recognize this. Oh, guy. yeah. What a beauty. God, I love that thing. The big Drago Tack. <clears throat> you got the one with the contoured handle and the M390 on the re release. Yeah, it's got the little diamond, diamond pattern M390. Oh, nice. And they, uh, they did an upgrade to the disc where yeah. they kind of put this gear pattern around it. Yeah. That actually allows you to wave it out of the pocket. Oh, nice. So when you, you pull it up, you just twist it a little bit and that'll catch. That's awesome. So yeah, I, I had that out um, a few days ago. Just well, do a comparison video. So then a, a number of, Mm, I don't. I, I don't know. Even know the time, but there was a, a there was a moment where it seemed like you shifted gears and really started going all out in custom fixed blades. Uh, an, another passion of mine. Uh, right. How did that come about? And and what are the what are you looking for in a custom fixed blade? Well, I blame two makers, uh, maybe three makers, right? Dirk Pinkerton, <laughs> Ken Vahikate. Basically, because I started seeing his work on your channel and I started seeing Dirk's work on your channel. But, of course, I was familiar with Dirk through his uh, designs for companies like Concept, the, right. the uh, Main Street and so forth. And um, quite a few from uh, Morgan Cohen's. Oh, God, his knives. Yeah, his knives are just exquisite. Um, now they're married to mm. some beautiful sheaths. Yeah, look at that. I have to give a shout out to uh, Pete Guster of uh, Guster Leather. Incredible. This is eel skin and reindeer. Wow. And uh, he gave me uh, plenty of uh, places to attach stuff. I didn't couldn't quite decide how I wanted the uh, the mount to be. So I can use a belt, a strap. I can put uh, even DCC clips through here. Oh, nice. And uh, that's a uh, custom Tonto that Morgan made for me. That's uh, eight inches of uh, Nitro V. His work is insane. And it's it's interesting because he's not a full-time maker. At, and no. then he does these batches of little not little but he does these small batches of perfection like out of nowhere like he just it, yeah he'll do four of them yeah and by the time they've hit the site in the early stages of production they're gone yeah yeah they're, they're spoken for um this was the other this was the bowie yeah this is the one i i really love so, let's, um, let's see this on one this one that you that he used the antiqued um canvas Oh, nice. And um, safari shark skin, he calls that. Wow. And uh, mm. I love that knife. He just did two new Bowies uh, like a day ago or yes yesterday. Those, yeah. or two. God, they're just beautiful. So is that what it is? I mean, what is it? obviously the knives that you already you, you could get a K bar uh, and it would handle probably a lot of the work that uh, either of those knives. Um, so what's with the customs? Yeah, what's with the customs? Um, I think in the long run, more value. Uh, you can tune them to what you want, but there's caveats there too. And that what you see two-dimensionally and you say, make me this, but do that and change this and change that. You may still get it and still not be happy with it because there's one 
one thing about a production knife, if you get it from, let's say, the Knife Center or, or White Mountain and you don't like it, you send it back, right? I would be hesitant to send a custom back to a maker when nothing was wrong with it. Yeah. Other than the fact that I didn't like the design or it didn't feel right in my hand. Now, I got some beautiful knives from Ken Vahikate. Uh, They happen to have a handle that's a little too small for my hand, and I don't have extremely large hands, but I like a, a handle that fills my grip, that when I begin to grip it, you know, I feel that I'm hanging on to it. Mm-hmm. That's why with a lot of the small fixed blades, um, here's a Pinkerton. Let's see that. Which one do you got there? Oh, yeah. That's the, uh, that's a Warncliffe. That's the uh, Urban Nomad. After Dirk sold me this, he said, I'm so sad that I sold you that. That was my favorite knife. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's in Magna Cut. And uh, he likes that concept. And I've heard you say that it's good to have a handle with nothing sticking out. Yeah. You know, regarding disarms and so forth. But that really applies more to sticks than it does to knives, unless you've got a humongous pommel. Stick right, out, you know, if it sticks out, um, so that's an example of a handle I would call just big enough, right? Right, mm-hmm. not always my favorite size handle, though. Here's a handle that I deem to be perfect for me, and that's the chopper from Bastinelli. Now, nice. with, with Bastinelli knives you pretty much are getting a custom knife that's a production knife. If you felt how this feels in the hand, Bob, it's like your hand is just married to that handle. The only thing I don't care about is that I'm not a real big fan of of, uh, trailing points because the anatomy of the trailing point is that on a cut, you're moving away from the tip. This is the uh, Mike Janich concept. Yeah. Right? That the the trailing point is trailing. Uh, are you familiar with Dan and Asanto's um, concept of zone of maximum pressure? Uh, yeah. It, uh, on a uh... so like a baseball bat, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to hit it in the sweet spot. And you got to hit it at the right moment. If you hit it too late, you get a, a foul ball. If you hit it too early, you get a foul ball, right? So the zone of maximum pressure is where the knife can do the most damage. And that's where Janich would take a knife like this is very similar to his Yojimbo in concept. And now... As that's arcing through, you see the point contacts yeah. first yeah. and continues to cut. People don't realize that, you know, on a on a thrust, it's a different matter, of course. Um, problem with thrusting this one, I mean, these are polar opposites, so they're good examples, right? If this one is thrusting and you have it like that, you're really hitting the upper portion of the belly. Uh, I listened to Fieldworks uh, do the uh, review on your show, mm-hmm. your podcast. Uh, is it uh, Greg? Um, it's um, Fieldworks. Uh, um, uh, Ryan Atkinson. Ryan, Ryan Atkinson. So based on that show, Bob, <laughs> here's a good one. Based on that show, if I can find the darn thing. Um, I picked up the knife that he was demoing. Uh, I've got to look at them all, check the handles. Was that the, uh, was that the, um, pioneer woman steak knife? Nope. Pioneer woman pairing knife. No, I like that one too, Uh, though. Uh, 
That's funny. I thought I stuck this. I'm going to go out. Oh, here we go. Black on black, everything disappears. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, a vandal. Oh, that's nice. So now for Pical, we're talking that is exactly where the point should be. When he yeah. held that in his hand and said that they raised the point, I could I could instantly see that because you know I I know the motions of the Pical usage, right? Mm -hmm. And you can still jab with it, right? When you have a Pical knife, you're not just doing this. Right. You, you're doing this. And Leo Gahe taught me how to flick that out. Yeah. It's, a, it's a jab, right? And when that comes back, guess what's happening? Yeah. You know, you're you're tearing, right? You're, you're making a triangular shape cut, not just a little jab. Yeah. So I saw that, and then I, I ended up getting the double-edged version. Because it uh, does have some usefulness, either in doing your your back cuts, right, or uh, even holding it this way. And, and holding it this way in Filipino arts, we're coming in, yeah, you know, on the uh, the nine and the eight. Well, that's that's what I was just thinking. Uh, like when I think of trailing points, uh, even some of my favorite knives, like trailing point bowies and stuff, I'm always thinking about the thrust from from an eight or a nine or a, like a, an angle five, five or something coming down yeah. like a shovel punch, uh, yeah. because you want to you want to engage that tip. Um, we're we're about out of time. I'm I'm grateful to you to, that you're going to be doing a, a couple of time though. <laughs> I know we're going to do a couple of extra minutes. Uh, people sure. should, people should stick around. I have a couple of other questions I want to, I want to ask you, but, but this one I think is a good one to wrap this up with because we're talking about collecting and we've gotten to this part where you and I love, which is tactical knives, um, martial arts and uh, the, the martial aspects of knives. If there's someone out there who has uh, started a knife collection, they don't have much, uh, in the way of, say, a defensive knife or a tactical knife or a combat knife. They want that kind of thing in their collection. What would you tell them? About uh, getting a specific knife, Bob? Yeah, what would you recommend? Um, I like the new Spartan. I didn't like it at first. The Poros. Okay. Oh, yeah. So you did not like that at first. Why? Um, I was having some trouble slipping off of the liner, trying to close it. But then I realized uh, I don't want it to close accidentally. And it's uh, there's no no need for speed when no you close rush. the knife. It's more when you open the knife. Yeah. Uh, because what they did with this one is fold it over. Mm. That's a folded over uh, liner. But it makes great contact and it feels super in the hand and it's got a great blade shape for edc yeah it's a beautiful knife and it's 154 cm so we're good there we've got a lot of traction on the handle and it's coming in um i believe well under 100. no i may be wrong on that it's it's under 150 it's like 125 yeah, or something yeah. like that so, yeah this this is a great recommendation dave because it's it's got all the things you're talking about. It's uh, uh, it has all the tactical things you're talking about because that's the kind of recommendation we're going for. It does make a great EDC though, everyday carry. Yeah. Um, but also, you're getting a a um, a knife from a great what is now becoming a legacy brand. I mean, Spartan Blades right. is not going anywhere, and they have a fantastic reputation. Um, right. And are you going to get their new trench knife? Yes, I must get the new trench knife. I also want to get the kukri. Uh, but yeah. yeah, the trench knife that I guess that'll be first on my like list. About a grand, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. It about oh no, it's RMJ's making that. I'm sorry. Oh, that's who it is. RMJ. I saw the one you were talking about. Yeah. In my mind's eye. Yeah, okay. RMJ. But yeah, um, I, I think you can't go wrong with the the Poros. Some people are saying it's maybe a little overpriced. So if you can find it at a, a bargain and have a coupon and so on and so forth, uh, you know, you could do that. 
Uh, and I think they're a little more widely available now than they were a few months ago when they first came out. All right, Dave, before I let you go, uh, one one piece of invaluable advice to the collector out there, be they new or be they old? Uh, start slow and um, study what it is that you want. Start off with some good basic reasons and, you know, find something you can carry with you and get familiar with. And I, I think your knife passion will grow based on that. Couldn't say it any better. Dave, this old sword blade reviews. Dave, thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie. It's always a pleasure. You. And you and I are kindred spirits with the, with the knives we love. I'll be talking to you soon, sir. Take care. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Dave Everett. He says, start off slow and um, maybe he should take his own advice. Nah, I'm just kidding. He's been collecting a long time. And as I said up front, he's had some some real buttes. So he's had a, an opportunity to hone in his vision for his collection. And uh, that's something I'm constantly struggling with. All right. Uh, join us next week for another great conversation about knives with another awesome knife person. And uh, join us Wednesday for the midweek supplemental. Thursday, you you can actually join us for Thursday Night Knives, which is live 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And what I mean is you can actually come on the show and join me. There's a simple link we float on screen, and you can pop right on. I'd love to meet you. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.